members this afternoon. Jean O'Brien is the distinguished McKnight University Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. And she is one of the foremost scholars of Native American life in colonial New England and more generally of American culture. And this afternoon she will be talking to us on the memory work of Massasoit, a topic that she explored in her most recent book, Monumental Mobility, which she co-wrote with her former student Lisa Blee. Professor O'Brien's first book, Dispossession by Degrees, Indian Land and Identity in Natick from 1650 to 1790, grew out of her dissertation at the University of Chicago. And subsequently she has written or co-written or co-edited more than half a dozen other volumes. And she also serves as the co-editor of the University of Massachusetts Press's Native Americans of the Northeast series. She's a founder and has been president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. She has been president of the American Society for Ethnohistory. She is a trustee of the Newbery Library. She has served on the editorial collective for reviews in American history. She was on the advisory board to the five part We Shall Remain PBS American Experience series. In 2014, the Secretary of the Interior appointed her to the Cobell Education Scholarship Fund Board of Trustees. She served on the program committees for both the American Studies Association and the American Historical Association. She's received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Native American History from the Western History Association. And we also hope that soon she will be a member of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts to add that to her many honors and accomplishments. Uh, Professor O'Brien is a white earth Ojibwe. She's a scholar and teacher who's been recognized by her peers, both nationally and at the University of Minnesota, as a leader in the field of early American and Native American histories and I am really delighted to have her with us this afternoon to talk about the memory work of Massasoit. Please welcome Jean O'Brien. Thank you so much, Bob, for that lovely introduction and thank you for having me today. I'm gonna to go ahead and try to share my screen right now. Let's see how this goes. There we go. Share. My students are usually helping me with this. I think we are set to go. Okay. So, and you can hear me all right? Bob, you can hear me, hear me fine? Okay, great. Among the remarkable events of this past summer in direct response to the murder of George Floyd was a resurgent activism in solidarity with Black Lives Matter movement around mo monuments to white supremacy and colonialism. Protesters in sites around the UK forced a reckoning with statues and places named for wealthy slavers. Belgian protesters forced the city of Antwerp to remove a statue of King Leopold II and in the United States, attention turned to statues glorifying Confederate generals, the lost cause, and racist oppression in dozens of communities. In Albuquerque in July, one protester was shot by an armed militiaman while denouncing a heroic statue of Juan de Oñate, the despotic colonial governor of New Mexico who brutalized Pueblo peoples. Police in riot gear broke up the gathering with tear gas and the statue removed, was removed. Protesters in Richmond and St. Paul toppled statues of Christopher Columbus in several other cities, including Columbus, Ohio, removed their statues preemptively. Richmond activist Chelsea Wiggs Wise announced, we have to start where it all began. We have to start with the people who stood first on the land, unquote. Protesters in Boston beheaded the Columbus statue and Boston's mayor announced that it would be put in storage followed by conversations about its historical meaning in the place in public display. This was not the first time or place nor the last that monuments to Columbus have been targeted. Across Indian country, attention has turned to removing symbols and names that celebrate colonialism and maintain indigenous oppression from the removal of the racist name of the Washington's NFL football team to renaming a famous California ski result to the vandalization and decision to mothball the statues of pioneer mother and father on the campus of the University of Oregon in June, 2020. This moment carries a notable sense of urgency and momentum. Uh, 
uh, uh, Richmond Indigenous Society member Vanessa Bolin stated that she came to demand the removal of the Columbus statue not to hijack the protests over police brutality, but rather to stand in solidarity. These and countless other anti-racism protests over monuments announced a dramatic resurgence of struggle over memorialization to white supremacy that spiked in the wake of the rally in Charlottesville in 2017 that resulted in the tragic death of Heather Heyer in an attack on the anti-racism protesters. These events in Charlottesville unfolded just as we were finishing our book, Monumental Mobility, the Memory Work of Massasoit, that interrogates public memorials implicated in the politics of colonialism and appropriation. In the preface to our book, we pause to suggest that the vital public engagement with monuments to white supremacy ought to be placed in dialogue with the monumental scaffolding around settler colonialism and historical figures such as Columbus, which seem to be ramping up even more in the here and now. Monumental mobility is situated within the terrain of intense debate over the placement, displacement, and replacement of monuments to difficult histories. We take as our case study the statue of Massasoit by sculptor Cyrus Dolan. Installed in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1921 to commemorate the terse centenary of the landing of the pilgrims, Dolan's statue was intended to memorialize the Poconoke at Massasoit as a welcoming diplomat who negotiated the first treaty with the English. As well, the Massasoit was a participant in the mythical first Thanksgiving that stands at the center of American national origin stories. In a brief note here, Massasoit is actually the Wampanoag word for leader. His actual name was Osamiquan, meaning yellow feather. The statue was commissioned by the improved order of red men, an all white fraternal order, hoping to demonstrate their patriotism through a bronze monument to Indians purportedly peaceful embrace of the pilgrims. But Massasoit, the statue did not remain only in Plymouth. In our book, we track the physical and narrative mobility of the Massasoit story through its inception and movement through in the guise of several unauthorized reproduction to numerous US locations through nefarious dealings in the fine art market to illuminate how the statue's attachments to national origins did and did not move with the installations. Taking at his point of departure, the replication of an original statue with the status of fine art, our book examines its mobility from multiple angles. It analyzes the original inspiration for the monument, its design, installation in various locations, dedication ceremonies in diverse places over time, how to understand its receptions by audiences, including indigenous ones, how it has and does figure in tourism, and importantly, how indigenous public intellectuals have intervened in historical narratives around settler colonialism read through the Massasoit statue, which is my focus today. What we found was that the meaning of the statue, along with the story of colonization and the founding of the nation it was commissioned to invoke, continues to evolve in Massachusetts and wherever the copies wound up. The force behind these changed meanings are twofold, we think. Through the work of indigenous intellectuals and the ways in which public history can reconfigure a relationship to the present through engagement with the past. The historical memories surrounding the Massasoit suggest the rich potential of indigenous public historians to intervene in sanitized national narratives of origins. Can the statue prompt viewers to reckon with the structural violence of settler colonialism in commemorative landscapes, or does it further entrench celebratory narratives of national origins? Our book is connected to that volatile debate, suggesting that monuments to settler colonialism ought to be part of the conversation about the place and meaning of historical monuments in general. Indigenous interventions in New England public history have made steady inroads since the historic day of mourning protests in 1970 that came to be an annual event. These upended pilgrim-centered centered myths and have reverberated in the historic district of Plymouth and the surrounding area, including in connection to one of the town's storied historical institutions, Plymouth Plantation, recently renamed Plymouth Patuxet. In our book, we turn to this living history venue and other New England public history sites and lots of other things to take up the work of indigenous, indigenous public intellectuals since the rupture of the inaugural day of mourning protests, including their connection to what was destined to become a fairly obscure eight episode historical reality television series aired by PBS in 2004, Colonial House. These, and very, these very different and yet intertwined instances of public history, in addition to the memorial landscape in Wampanoag homelands, are all a form of time freezing where guests and cast members and viewers, in the case of Colonial House, 
are prompted to strive to embody the past, a particular approach to closing historical distance and making visceral connections to the past. These sites also became places where indigenous public intellectuals contested historical memory and forced direct engagement with the violence of settler colonialism in ongoing and dynamically reimagined ways. They also demonstrate the disjuncture between the impulse to freeze history, whether in 1621, the Massasoit statue, 1627 or 24, living history at Plymouth Plantation, or 1628, reenacted in Colonial House, and the vital fact that Indigenous peoples are highly motivated to both embody this history and demonstrate in no uncertain terms that they are still here as modern peoples looking to the future. I want to now focus on the particular mode of embodying history to close the distance between the present and the past that came in the form of Colonial House. The series website declares, think colonial life was all about pirates, pilgrims, powdered wigs, and freedom for all? Think again. Two dozen modern day time travelers find out the hard way what early American colonial life was really like when they take up residence in colonial house, unquote. The cast of men, women, and children from the US and England arrive shipboard to an imaginary new world charged with building a profitable colony using only the technology of the time. Though set in 1628, coastal Maine on Passamaquoddy land, Colonial House is clearly about recreating the landing of the pilgrims in Plymouth and their struggles to build a colony complete with staged encounters with native people. This is a year after Plymouth Plantation's baseline year of interpretation of 1627, although they recently moved three years earlier to 1624. The parallels intended by this historical reality show are unmistakable, and it is no surprise that Plymouth Plantation played a leading role in shaping the series. It drew on expertise from its personnel in building the village where it is set, and they served as living history experts along with counterparts from England. Cast members spent two weeks at the plantation in intensive training in the technology, material, culture, and attire of the time. Staff built the structures and finished them on location, familiar tasks for them, but now imparted to people who would spend four months living the experience in a remote location for the cameras. Linda Coombs, Aquina Wampanoag, and Ramona Peters, Mashpee Wampanoag, joined John Bear Mitchell, Penobscot, and Donald Saktoma, Passamaquoddy, as consultants for the series. Coombs and Peters are highly vis visible Native intellectuals, and they appear in one of the most powerful of the episodes called The Reckoning, along with several Native people affiliated with Plymouth Plantation. It features a clan of Wampanoags traveling to visit their relatives. In one of the most pointed exchanges, changes inside the village, Wampanoag Nancy Eldridge chastises a fellow native for accepting food from the colonists, which they all had agreed not to do. She sternly corrected him. We just don't want it to appear like, you know, happy Indians in the first Thanksgiving because it wasn't like that at all. And if we were to be treated in a good way even today and our land wasn't still being taken, we weren't still being thought as a unintelligible savages, then I would say, you know, fine, unquote. Following this tense exchange, the voiceover informs the viewer. Relations between the colonists and Native Americans are romanticized in the traditional Thanksgiving story. It's commonly thought that in 1621, the Wampanoag joined the colonists in a friendly three-day feast, unquote. Ramona Peters points out, we know that wouldn't have been the case, and would-be col colonists acknowledge that that really must be right. The voiceover adds detail Peters herself has highlighted in her writings to underscore her point. Quote, the real story is that 90 Wampanoag men showed up after hearing gunfire. Instead of war, they found the Plymouth colonists preparing for a feast. In the interests of diplomacy, the Wampanoag joined in, but the event was never to be repeated, unquote, and subsequently informs the viewer about the day of mourning that has been held on Thanksgiving Day in Plymouth since 1970. This scene sets up one of the most soul-searching moments in the whole series. At a solemn meal in the evening, the colonists process their day. Paul Hunt, an Englishman who portrayed a servant in the series, laments. She kept mentioning the English and looking at me in particular, and she said, you guys, the English, you came over here, you did this and you did that. If she had said your ancestors, it would be one scenario. I just found the whole thing quite offensive, unquote. Carolyn Hines, who at the time was portraying, portraying the governor's wife, retorted that your society was the imperial power that colonized for 300 years half the world. So if you've got a little bit of discomfort about it, it probably does you a little bit of good too. 
Nobody likes to have it pointed out that your people and your culture has been responsible for their suffering. We need to have it pointed out though, unquote. Another participant assents. Carolyn continues, it suddenly sunk in in a way that it hadn't up until then, that I'm going along with being an imperialist, some murmur in assent. She adds, it didn't really sink in on me that I'm reenacting a whole system that I don't believe in and I disapprove of. And yet it's the roots of our nation, it's who we are, unquote. The group continues to contemplate and not for the first or the last time in this series, Caroline gets the final say. She reflects that being troubled over the US in the context of the world by calculation post 9-11 prompted her to participate in the project. I thought how good it might be to go back and to relive an earlier, simpler, purer point in our national history. So here I am. And of course, what I'm discovering is there were no pure moments in our national history. This is not a pure moment. We were already moving in. We were already driven by greed and ambitious ambition, and we were willing to shove away the native people. So what was better then than now? Sniffles are audible. I don't know, unquote. The episode closes with silent contemplation over a fire. From the first episode, the intent of native consultants and participants to confront efforts to freeze them in a sanitized past was revealed when Mitchell announced to the cast members, quote, we've been through the largest genocide, the largest Holocaust in the soil of the United States. We are the recipients of all that death and the Holocaust that happened on this soil was one of embarrassment for this country, unquote. The reckoning brings this indigenous perspective into bold relief with the buildup to the confrontation in the village. The narrator foreshadows the action in the episode by announcing the natives are prepared to confront the settlers over the issue of colonization, unquote. Over the course of several scenes, the argument unfolds. Aquina Wampanoag, Jonathan Perry points out, being here is a chance to represent our people, to show that we are a continuing culture and a continuing people, a modern people, as well as having deep roots with our ancestors and to have our story heard, unquote. In the same scene, Eldris justifies indigenous anger as legitimate, quote, especially when it seems like America in general doesn't like our history to be told, unquote. Mashpee Alice Lopez illustrates the ongoing impact of the structure of settler colonialism by insisting Indian land is still being taken all over the country. And as long as you don't acknowledge native people, then you don't have to acknowledge that you're doing anything wrong to anyone, unquote. The reckoning represents a crescendo in the collision of historical narratives about origins and a powerful rejection of frozen narratives that refuse to explain the origins and still reverberating consequences of the United States as a settler colonial nation. While the Corky Colonial House Project constituted a one-time media intervention that was largely ignored, indigenous public intellectuals take up the work of overturning mythological ideas about history in the town of Plymouth on a daily basis. The memorial landscape in Plymouth, including the Massasoit statue, helps those who traverse it to make meaning of New England's and the nation's history. The town of Plymouth was built directly atop the thousand year old village of Pawtuxet, a thriving community with an estimated population of 2000 in the first decades of the 1600s. Villagers were in occasional contact with the Europeans set on trading, slaving or plundering the coast. But starting in 1616, Pawtuxet was hit hard by a wave of epidemics. When the Mayflower dropped anchor in the bay in 1620, the colonists would have seen a village only recently evacuated as the survivors sought refuge elsewhere. When colonists erected shelters amid the existing houses and grave sites, they claimed the renamed place in honor of the home they left behind. Nearly half of the Mayflower passengers died that first winter. They were buried in a mass grave near the waterfront, now called Coles Hill, upon which a commemorative statue of the Wampanoag leader was erected 300 years later. This is a story about a place undergoing terrible suffering and loss. Yet the Massasoit statue and the Thanksgiving myth that later attached to this place casts a positive glow. This is a place composed of welcoming Indians and well-meaning well pilgrims, making Plymouth into the birthplace of the nation. It is the story of peaceful colonization that the improved order of red men had hoped to celebrate and cast in bronze. A tourist to, in, to Plymouth today can easily access this pilgrim-centered story as we did on our research trips. By gazing upon a diminutive rock, we are instructed to venerate, taking a tour with a pilgrim-clad pilgrim guide who insists the Pawtuxet gave away their land because they no longer wanted it. Not true. By listening to a visitor center volunteer explain that all the native residents had died off, we actually heard them say that. <laughs> 
and by perusing the town's gift shops stuffed with depictions of happy pilgrims and Indians sharing a feast. The memorial landscape and dominant narratives of its history insist on maintaining a cognitive distance from the past that insulates visitors from uncomfortable truths, even as they purport to bring visitors closer to history by connecting them to hallowed ground. Yet in connection with the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's contact with Patuxet last year, Wampanoag and other indigenous public intellectuals brought new energy to their engagement with this landscape to craft a more complicated and coherent depiction of New England's past. Unlike most of the memorial landscape in Plymouth, which freezes the town as an English place, these educators created ways to introduce visitors to long excluded experiences and perspectives. Tourists can now join Tim Turner on his native Plymouth tours where Pawtuxet becomes visible and the crowded memorial landscape on the waterfront can be reevaluated from an indigenous perspective. They can also visit museums, libraries, and Plymouth plantation programs that offer guidance and instruction in Wampanoag experiences in the 17th century and today. Visitors may feel discomfort that comes with new awareness of a more complex reality and history, but such experiences with historical memory does the work of closing the cognitive distance between the past and the present. How and why do indigenous intellectuals engage with this difficult public facing work? The indigenous public intellectuals we engage with in Plymouth are part of a progressive movement that insists native peoples must be heard and have a role in shaping public history in the region's history, public, public, excuse me, public understanding of the region's history. They are building upon the foundation of the day of morning gathering, which we see is vitally important. The gathering began in response to an attempt to censure and exclude indigenous voices. In 1970, the town of Plymouth invited Wampanoag activist Wamsetta Frank James to speak at an event marking the 350th anniversary of the Mayflower's landing. But upon reviewing James's planned remarks, the event organizers deemed his speech insufficiently celebratory and provided James with a speech of their own, which James refused to read, prompting the organizers to uninvite him. James made his way to Massasoit to, to read his speech in protest to a gathering of fewer than a dozen people. Quote, this is a time of celebration for you, but it, was a, it is with a heavy heart that I look back upon what happened to my people. Massasoit and his people welcomed and befriended the settlers of the Plymouth Plantation. This action by Massasoit was perhaps our biggest mistake, unquote. James organized the activist group United American Indians of New England following this incident, and they have held a national day of mourning at the statue on Thanksgiving Day ever since. As a young activist, Mashpee Wampanoag Paula Peters delighted in the day of mourning gatherings in Plymouth. And with the latest anniversary of the Mayflower Landing, Peters led a team of a Wampanoag team of designers, researchers, and interpreters in creating a traveling exhibit titled Our Story, 400 Years of Wampanoag History, aimed at non-Indian audiences. Peters and her team produced and toured exhibit panels started, starting in 2014, adding panel, panels every year up to 2020. The first, titled Captured 1614, presents the Wampanoag perspectives on the slaving expedition of Englishman Thomas Hunt, who seized 27 men and boys from Pawtuxet and Nauset. Peters explained in a press release, this is a crucial piece of our history of Plymouth that can't be told accurately without a Wampanoag voice, unquote. Indeed, how else to explain initial distrust of the Mayflower passengers and how to squantum also known as Squanto, one of the men abducted in 1614 and returned home five years later, had learned enough English to greet the colonists in English. Another panel, The Great Dying, takes up the epidemic that reached such destruction starting in 1616. In addition to chronicling and contextualizing these historical events with straightforward text, the exhibit also includes a series of videos that pack an emotional punch. In a reenactment of the 1614 abduction, young Wampanoag men struggle against English captors on the beach, then sit bound and terrified in the ship's hull. In several clips, Wampanoag people dressed in fur mantles and deerskin relate the experiences of suddenly losing husbands, brothers, sons, and fathers. In one clip, Natana Hicks Green Deer wonders about the savagery of people who would snatch men from their families and imagines how her children will suffer without their father. Viewers witnessed uh, speakers dressed in period clothing expressing real emotions of grief. Peters told us she didn't direct the speakers to act in any prescribed fashion, 
She simply told them the facts and asked them to imagine themselves in such a situation. The Wampanoag interpreters modeled for viewers how to close the distance between the past and the present to access both the emotional impact of a disorienting loss and the experiences of those who live with the knowledge of this history as part of their contemporary identities. We see these difficult histories as presented in this and other Our Story panels to be impactful for a number of reasons. First, the deeply researched exhibit engages viewers with themes of trauma and colonial violence in a deliberately non-confrontational manner. That is, the events are placed in their historical context, but the colonial legacies and evidence of indigenous resilience are made accessible today as well. As Peters reflected in the Positive Republic response to the exhibit and its intention to prompt viewers to question comforting narratives, she asserted the truth, quote, had to be told them in a way that made them think, unquote. The second way in which this presentation is impactful is that the panels provide important context for understanding the place that the Mayflower passengers encountered in 1620 and the upheavals and crises that explain Osamequan's decision to forge an alliance with the colonists. The feel-good story of Indigenous acquiescence no longer makes sense when they start the story in 1614 and include Indigenous perspectives. It is disrupting the teleological narrative upon which the quadrant is based. Which events matter to the identity of the nation and who has the power to choose anniversaries worthy of commemoration? This is an ingenious way to contribute to the Plymouth 400 year anniversary programming while also destabilizing its implied chronology and subverting its inherent narrative. The exhibit designers both enlarged the historical consciousness of America's shared past and disrupted the assumption that history begins when the colonists set foot on the shore. Their interventions prompt visitors to wonder what if we freeze a moment in 1614, 1619, or even 1970 and take a look around? What kind of world do we find? And what can such time travel teach us about contingency, resilience, and our capacity for change? We see Massasoit, the statue, as an important touchstone in public history that sets up a complex, complex push and pull dynamic around the problem of historical memory. The improved order of Redmen erected it as a manifestation of their own historical distancing from the violence of the colonial encounter. And yet, as with all monuments, meaning comes from engagement with the statue and the story it is intended to fix in bronze. Our book asks, how effective has the Red Man's project been in the long run? What is the place of the Massasoit in time, in space, and in narratives of the nation? Does the statue secure the distance intended by the Red Men in the historical memory of this imagined foundational moment? What meaning do people make of the history in those distant locations where casts of Massasoit came to be mounted? Salt Lake City, Provo, Kansas City, Chicago, Spokane, and Dayton, which is a little bit of a tease for the book. To what extent do observers hold on to the historical distancing implicit in the narrative of the Massasoit that so profoundly elides the violence of settler colonialism? What we found illustrates how multivalent historical meaning making can be in divergent places. This particular set of monuments to the Massasoit opens a fascinating window onto the process of historical memory formation or the crucial work that physical location and cognitive distance perform on historical memory. In these public locations, indigenous people insist on a reckoning with the past and the present that refuses narratives of frozen Indians in a place sanitized of the violence and trauma of settler colonialism. In all of these locations, historical memory is contested rather than resolved for once and for all. Historical meaning making is revealed as dynamic, interactive, unsettled, open to interpretation. Indigenous people use the statue as well as the locations of living history to explain settler colonialism as a structure. Indigenous dispossession set loose at that moment and continuing as a system of oppression rather than an event, the peace treaty or the mutual defense alliance, depending on your perspective. In these senses, Massasoit opens a window not just on how to think about the distance between that historical moment and the present, but also the distance between very different non-Indian and indigenous projects of commemoration. For indigenous peoples, there is a double distancing operating. The distance between the memorialized moment and now, and the distance between native and non-Indian willingness to embrace uncomfortable histories. They refuse to be frozen in this narrative, but instead insist that the past be reckoned with in a way that includes their perspectives on history and the ongoing ramification of their lives under settler colonialism. Imagined from these multiple vantage points, 
Massasoit finds a place in a highly mobile interpretive terrain that unsettles rather than fixes historical, nar historical narratives in bronze and stone. The National Day of Mourning was born in response to a significant anniversary in settler memory, yet it set in motion an alternative timeline that emphasizes indigenous resilience through a shared past. In 1970, Wampadog activist Wamsada Frank James was disinvited from speaking at the 350th anniversary because his interpretation of the event. In response, he initiated a new timeline of Wampanoag protest and visibility, one that would, would be observed that point forward in calendrical time. The next year, under the leadership of Wampanoag activists Tall Oaks and Brian Miles, Plymouth Plantation established the Wampanoag program to be staffed by Native people. Linda Coombs recalled that establishing the program, which allowed visitors for the first time, quote, to hear our story from our perspective, unquote, was a knockdown drag out fight, but it was initiated, quote, as a direct result of the first national day of mourning, unquote. It created the opportunity for generations of Wampanoag and other native employees to conduct intensive research into the 17th century world and learn skills and techniques their ancestors had mastered. Coombs noted that when visitors direct, were directed to the Wampanoag home site before entering the English village beginning in the late 90s, quote, that just flipped the whole script, unquote. Visitors released their reverence for the colonists and demanded to know why English stole Indian land. Quote, the effect was noticeable, unquote. The long-term impacts of the Day of Warning can be seen in other ways as well. The annual Day of Mourning protests picked up urgency and attracted more militant activists in the 1990s. Marches through the city provoked fear of disorder that the town of Plymouth was anxious to quell. One significant result of negotiations between Plymouth and United American Indians of New England was the installation of a plaque with an ex explanation of the Day of Mourning beside Massasoit. If our interviews with passersby in Plymouth are any indication, local residents and tourists alike have taken note of the plaque and many have reflected on the alternative narrative of Thanksgiving and the settler colonialism it explains. It was evidence in stone and metal that colonists did not disembark in the wilderness, that indigenous people did not give away their land and then dutifully die off. For those paying attention to the plaque, the story of peaceful colonization stopped making sense. Ever since its installation, visitors moved by the plaque's words have taken this more complicated narrative home with them. The annual day of mourning protests and the plaque beside the statue change interpretations of Massasoit and disrupt the ritualized Thanksgiving mythology in Plymouth. And yet, as such episodes enter the larger stage of debate, they suggest that a reckoning with the violent and conflicted past still reverberating, excuse me, reverberating in the present is an ever larger element of public consciousness. As the mythologized origins of the nation and English settler colonial memory, Plymouth is a crucial site for disrupting the dominant narrative of Indian acquiescence and disappearance at the root of so many other memorial controversies across the US and elsewhere. On the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing, Wampanoag saw an opportunity to teach people about the complexities of colonial history and foster an alternative temporal consciousness. Similar to the creation of the Wampanoag program at Plymouth Plantation, the Plymouth 400 board tasked with planning commemorative events for 2020 was formed in response to indigenous protest. Linda Coombs recalled how the board invited Wampanoag perspectives, quote, because they really do not want what they did 100 years ago when white residents performed as Wampanoags in a pageant and the Massasoit was installed on Coal Hill or have a whole nother Frank James thing like in 1970, unquote. Wampanoag involvement in Plymouth 400 has resulted in the temporal reconfiguration of settler memory in two really interesting ways, we think. The first is to insist on James's 1970 speech act as year zero of Wampanoag perspectives on the American origin story that will no longer be ignored or silenced in connection to settler colonialism. 2020 in this alternative timeline represents the 50th anniversary of the creation of the day of mourning rather than the 400th anniversary of a different event. The Our Story exhibit hits this point home with its final panel, which focuses on the Day of Mourning Gathering. If anniversaries help us recall and ritualize memories in calendrical time, Wampanoags insist upon an acknowledgement of additional events in a shared history between Indigenous people and non-Natives. We want to underscore how important this visibility is to New England Indians who still struggle mightily to have the general public acknowledge their existing existence and ongoing sovereignty at all.
The second way in which Wampanoag elders and teachers have crafted a new historical consciousness around Plymouth, the Plymouth 400th anniversary is by starting our story exhibit in 1614 with a traumatic abduction. They insist upon moving the timeline back six years to more fully contextualize English Wampanoag relations when the Mayflower Pilgrims founded their colony on the Bay. This kidnapping and the epidemics that followed soon after form, quote, a critical backstory to colonization in the roots of the American holiday, Thanksgiving, unquote. From the Wampanoag perspective, the agreement of mutual defense that Osumikwan famously negotiated with the English can only make sense when taking into account the ways in which the slaving expedition and the epidemics devastated their ancestors, threatened their understanding of the entire cosmos, and weakened the Wampanoag nation politically and militarily in the years immediately prior to the pilgrim's arrival. Wampanoag educators have responded to the settler colonial narrative, particularly the myth of peaceful first contact and Thanksgiving, rather than exclusively crafting their own separate history in public protests, plaques, performances, and exhibits. The point here is that they are engaging. They thus illustrate the creative potential of directly confronting a deeply painful history of settler colonialism. While the disruptions to settler memory may focus on undoing myths, challenging narratives of disappearance, and especially addressing the anniversaries of the peaceful founding of the nation, Wampanoag historical interventions have been generative and creative rather than simply passive or reactionary. The decades of work of indigenous people that has gone into flipping the script on this history in Plymouth reverberate out, illustrating how memorial interventions can foster dialogue about the legacies of settler colonialism far from the New England coast. In spring 2017, a protest erupted in Minneapolis over a controversial interactive sculpture called Scaffold installed in the Walker Art Center Sculpture Garden. The white multimedia artist of the piece, Sam Durant, who had grown up near Plymouth, intended his work to represent the gallows used in executions of political dissidents, freedom fighters, and Native Americans, specifically the 38 Dakota men hanged in Mankato, Minnesota after the devastating US Dakota War in 1862 to explore issues of inequality, race, and state violence in US history. The design of the scaffold was based on the heinous device built specifically to hang all 38 Dakota warriors simultaneously. But Dakota protesters argued that art were trivialized a traumatic event in their history. Viewers could walk on and off the scaffold without having to grapple with the deep pain the executions inflicted in the region. Quote, this is a murder machine that killed our people because we were hungry, unquote, said Sam Woodity, Crow Creek Dakota. Durant listened to Dakota elders and agreed to remove the piece and sign over the intellectual rights to the Dakota nation. As he recalled from the conversations, quote, the Dakota people basically saw something that looked like a monument to their massacre, unquote. Durant admitted they had not understood the local context, which included the fact that state history textbooks had only acknowledged the forced removal of the Dakota people in 2015. The legislature had decided over the protests of native citizens not to relocate most of the artwork in the state's capital Senate chambers glorifying cultural and racial superiority over the Dakota nation and a controversy had arisen over how to commemorate the bicentennial of a military fort built on a site of Dakota spiritual significance that served as an internment camp for Dakota women, children, and elders after the Mankato executions. Although the details of local history are specific to the region and the Dakota nation, such controversies over the persistence of settler memory in public spaces, halls of government, commemorations, and historical narratives can be found across the United States and elsewhere. As he reflected on his evolving awareness of the presence of the colonial past, Durant recalled witnessing a protest on Plymouth Rock in the early 1970s when he was quite young. Quote, it was the United American Indians of New England. They were saying, hey America, this is a catastrophe for us, not a celebration, it's a day of mourning. I remember thinking, oh, there's another side to this, unquote. As he saw in Plymouth and belatedly realized in Minneapolis, Acknowledging that the nation has been built on dispossession and violence involves an uncomfortable dialogue about the structure of power that continues to shape collectively, collective memory in place and in time and everywhere, really. Durant's failure to anticipate the heart-wrenching responses of Dakota people illustrates the power of settler memory to isolate and expunge heinous moments of violence while leaving antiseptic national narratives intact. For Durant, in this particular moment, colonialism was effectively a singular event rather than a structure, underscoring the power of settler colonialism to erase its ubiquitous pulverizing of indigenous peoples, plates, histories, 
places, histories, and rights. So it's not so straightforward after all. Indigenous people have taken on the task of reframing Massasoit in placing the story of what they interpret as the St. Thomas Mutual Defense Agreement within a context, a larger context of indigenous suffering, survival, and resilience. The monument thus serves as a site of intervention, an opportunity to disrupt settler memory and install an alternative temporal consciousness. Wampanoag people have held a National Day of Mourning protest at the site of the statue since 1970 as a way to embody counter narratives to Thanksgiving Day celebrations that violate indigenous understandings of settler colonialism rooted so particularly in Plymouth. A revisionist marker installed next to Massasoit addresses the violence unleashed upon indigenous people after the English arrived, effectively closing the cognitive distance between Osinequin's time and our own. With these interventions, a space can open up for a reconsideration of history and identity, and viewers have the opportunity to grapple with discomforts and new forms of memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Very interesting presentation. I will invite people who have questions to post them in the chat or in the question and answer. I'm not quite sure if you raise your hand, if I'll be able to call on you. But um, thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation. I wondered, you did speak a little bit about something that's really a broader interest um, on the cognitive distance between the past and the present and the way there is this constant dialogue. and. Uh, I mean, you've already expressed this, you've already talked about this in a very interesting way. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about how we reshape our understanding of the past based on, on what's happening in the present. Are we always bound by what we see in the present uh, to misunderstand the past? Well, I mean, that's a really, really complicated question, right, in consideration. And I think anybody who does history, anybody who is interested in history, people who participate in any activity you can find in the realm of public history is really, I think, in some ways, striving to close that distance, right? They're trying to understand the present and how it's connected to the past. We're constantly reshaping our questions based on what's happening in the present to see what in the past brings us to where we are in the present. So I think that that's part of it. It's just for me at the core of what historians do and how, how they try to imagine what the past was like, which we can only, of course, ever do partially. And so this part of the closing of, of the present and the past from the indigenous perspective, it's really a new project in many ways in the broader sense of having it be part of a broader national dialogue. Of course, indigenous people have always had this story and versions of these stories with them. So it's that engagement that I think is adding the layers of complexity to the national story. And I I'm just, again, the, the work that the people like Paula Peters and Linda Coombs and many other people have done has been so important in that really complicated problem. And I should point out that in the uh, Colonial Society republished William Bradford's journal last year, and Paula Peters has an extraordinary introduction to it. And in fact, the book also begins with a quote from um, Frank Wamsuda's um, James's um, speech at Plymouth Rock, which is, um, so we are trying to bring together these different perspectives because you're right, this is really, it, it is a dialogue we're still engaged in. Right. I mean, in the, in the commemoration at that moment at 350 looks really different than it does today. Unfortunately, truncated because of the pandemic. Yes. So many amazing programs were, were organized and all the hard work that was put into those things that should have been face-to-face, -face, including events in England and in mm -hmm. the Netherlands. So that all that is, is really uh, too bad. But, you know, the work that Paula did and the people she worked with, that's going to live on. I mean, and that's accessible. I actually, in teaching my Indian history course here at Minnesota in the fall, made Plymouth the spine of my course, because mm -hmm. of, especially because of 400. Right. And I was able to draw on all these wonderful things that they produced mm -hmm. to have, you know, Wampanoag people come right into the, the homes of my students who were re learning remotely at home. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's both, uh, the teaching during the pandemic has been both a challenge and an opportunity to yes. be able to do that. Yes. And it allows you to be here with us this afternoon as well. So, uh, now, how has your teaching of Plymouth changed over the course of your, you know, career as a as a teacher as well as an Ojibwe? Uh, 
Well, you know, I've been at this for a long time now. It, it, it's amazing to think back. I've been at the University of Minnesota for over 30 years now. I can't even believe it. And the, the sheer volume of excellent historical work that we can draw on now by both indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, it's just a different world. Yes. And uh, yeah, you know, just, it, well, actually, I'll go back to the very beginning of my involvement in New England, which was mm-hmm. quite accidental, really, uh, when I was working on my dissertation at the University of Chicago. And when I, when I, the, the, the story I was taught in graduate school was New England Indians have become extinct. That was, that was good professional history at the time. Yes. And my very first research trip, uh, it, I will never forget running into uh, Thomas Dalton, a Nipmuc person at the American Antiquarian Society. Wow. And so I made a link at the very, the very first trip. So I'm, and I, I didn't, I never believed that story, but I didn't understand the complexity of it either in terms of its contemporary dimensions because yeah. it just wasn't available. Yes. And so all of that is just completely different, including federal recognition of Wampanoag mm-hmm. nations and in all in all of all this other stuff that goes right. along with that right. recognition. Right. I, I do want to remind people we are recording this, so if you do ask a question, that will be part of it. Uh, and Jonathan Perry has uh, sent in a question. Jonathan saying, what do you think the steps forward from the 400 year demarcation point will be for indigenous inclusion in Wampanoag territory? And do you think the land back effort will bring positive land movements to Akina and Mashpee? Well, um, Jonathan, you're engaged in a lot of that important work. So um, kudos to you and let there be ever more space for you all to do this important work. Um, So there's that. That's what, mm-hmm. that's what I really hope for. I mean, just to get a little bit political for, for the moment, um, things are looking up on Mashpee with a new presidential administration, but we need, we need work on the front of defending indigenous sovereignty in New England still. Um, so there's that. And you know, having, having indigenous sovereignty recognized and firmed up in federal Indian law is an important place for that to be anchored. Let me put it that way. And so I, I think the future is very bright. And I think that there's an opportunity for Plymouth 400 to really make that effort blossom and that more and more attention be, be brought to the interventions of indigenous people in New England doing their own work. I hope that answers you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Let's see, William de Giacomantonio asks, um, to your knowledge, have British intellectuals and or activists ever addressed their historical transgressions by British colonists? And apologies if you've spoken to this point already or spoken to this point. Uh, I do not know very much about that. Hmm. Um, It's an interesting question because you raised that dialogue in the colonial house about the British. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only thing I can really say about this is um, I know that there are joint efforts between people in Plymouth and indigenous folks like Paul Peters that were designed to bring attention to indigenous history in the indigenous context in the context of Plymouth 400. And I honestly don't know whatever happened to those efforts. Mm-hmm because of the pandemic, but I know that they were heartfelt and really there was a lot of work going into that. So, I mean, to me, that's a kind of meeting together to think about this history together. That's really important. So I would say, I would say that I'm not sure where that's gone from there. Well, let me ask about Thanksgiving. (laughs) Okay. Is it safe for us to continue observing Thanksgiving? Um, You know, I have to say this question might get answered differently in New England. It might get get answered differently depending on the indigenous person that you're talking to. But uh, lots and lots of indigenous people take Thanksgiving to be their family day too, Mm -hmm. right? And and it's a time to reflect, but it's also a time to, to gather and be together as families, and you know, it's it's it has become in this moment. And I think aside aside from maybe 
elementary school so divorced from this narrative about you know, Indians and pilgrims and all of that, that I think it, it looks different now than it did, for example, in the, especially the late 19th and early 20th century, and was all about civil, civic engagement and assimilating immigrants and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I have to say, I mean, I did not understand the rich history of Thanksgiving until getting into this research, and I never thought I was going to actually write about it. So this mm -hmm. became a big surprise to me. Yeah. What are you, are you working on a new project now? I am working on two new projects right now, actually. I, um, I have a book that is in press that is, it's a co-edited volume with my colleague, Daniel Heath Justice, which is at the University of British Columbia, and it's called Allotment Stories, uh, Indigenous hmm. Land Under Settler Siege. And it's about land privatization schemes in colonial places. So it's a global indigenous studies Mm -hmm. project and that that's being published by the University of Minnesota Press next January. I'm really excited about that book mm -hmm. and then I have been off and on for many years actually turning my attention back to White Earth where I'm from and working on family history. My grandmother, my Ojibwe grandmother who lived with us for the last about 20 years of her life but always kept her home on the reservation, spent a lot of her time writing about her experiences and her memories and her oh. family history. Yeah. So I have those writings and I've transcribed them and I've written about them a little bit, but I'm on the cusp of really diving into actually doing uh, that, working on that history. As I said, I, I got, I came to New England quite by accident and I've been stuck there ever since. Wow. I keep on, there's things I keep on wanting to know about. So, but now it's time great. to come home. So, so what did bring you to New England? Study. So um, what brought me to New England was a complete accident of a graduate seminar, the very first one I ever took in graduate school, which was on um, community histories, which was what we were doing back in the days, right? And so I took this course and I had to do a seminar paper. And as I did for every project I can ever remember in my entire life, tried to figure out how to make it about Indians. And so I found Natick. Wow, here's a native, here's a native community. I'm going to I'm going to research this town, and and you know those narratives I mentioned a moment ago that we all had native people disappearing after King Philip's War. Mm -hmm. Well, you know we what the source material we were working with in that approach, vital records. I went to the vital records of of Natick, and there were Indians all over them. Mm -hmm. So this narrative made no sense, and I just got obsessed with figuring out what had happened here to reconstructing that history. And, and then at, at that point, finished writing that book. And then I'm, well, what made New Englanders think that New England Indians had become extinct? And mm -hmm. I'd kind of stumbled on local histories along the way. And I thought, this seems like a good place to look. Mm -hmm. so that brought me to my second book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And then this was just an accidental project, a complete total accident. Well. I literally was walking down the street in Kansas City, Missouri, mm -hmm. because I was going to a professional meeting, and lo and behold, there's Massasoit. Yeah. And my, what is this doing here? Is the is the actual genesis of this book? So mm -hmm. that became the project of figuring out what that. Right. I knew that belonged in Plymouth, but mm -hmm. you know most people wouldn't know that unless they know that history or they're from right. Massachusetts, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it came it became a whodunit, really. Very good. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jean O'Brien, for joining us this afternoon, and we look forward to your next projects, and we look forward to having you as a member of the Colonial Society, and thank you to everyone who joined us to hear Jean O'Brien talking about Massachusetts. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was nice to be here and nice to be considered. Great.